Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Weekly Defense Podcast, brought to you in partnership with our sponsor, Raytheon Intelligence and Space. I'm your host, Ben Vogel, and also with me today are Air Editor Tim Martin and Senior Land Reporter Tim Fish. Welcome back to both of you. Evening. Hi, Ben. Good to be speaking with you again. And uh, I gather you're slightly under the weather today, Tim Fish, so uh, we'll we'll be as sympathetic as possible with you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Yeah, just caught a bit of a cold, that's all. Just before we uh, look at the headlines, uh, I wanted to give uh, to our listeners an overview of the topics that we're going to be looking at uh, today. And uh, this week, we're staying in Europe and looking at German defence thinking and procurement strategy in defence, its modernisation efforts, implications and so forth across the air and land domains. And later in the show, Gordon Arthur joins us for a quick update on all the news from the Asia-Pacific region. And our sponsor provides this week's Industry Voice segment. But first, let's hear about some of the top stories this week in defence. NATO's Flying Training Europe programme took a major step forward last week after 10 members signed an MOU. Bulgaria, Croatia and Portugal had been poised to join, but they did not sign the document. However, Italy, previously unannounced in the programme, has joined the group. Italian participation comes as no surprise, as its Leonardo CAE advanced jet training joint venture is well-placed to provide NFTE with its first training campus. In Australia, the Department of Defence has belatedly acknowledged the need to upgrade the Royal Australian Navy's six Collins-class submarines. Even though the Collins-class life extension programme is yet to gain formal approval, the military believes that the first submarine can undergo an upgrade in 2026. The plan is for all six Collins submarines to be overhauled in turn, as opposed to previous plans which intended to overhaul just three boats. And in Russia, the MOD is going ahead with a prototype of the Sturm armed UGV system, which is based on the T-72 chassis. Industry sources indicate that a typical Sturm system will comprise a manned command and control vehicle, possibly also based on the T-72, and several unmanned heavy vehicles. UGVs had been tested in Syria in 2016, but several serious issues became apparent, such as command and control, mobility, and lost connection with the operator, as well as instability issues with the main armament and spontaneous missile launches. And this concludes the headlines. You can, of course, find out more about these topics by visiting our website, shepherdmedia.com slash news. Time now to shine a spotlight on Germany. Let's start by looking at the German defence budget this year, which is forecast to reach about $65 billion, which clearly sounds a lot and is the third biggest NATO budget behind the US and the UK. However, on the other hand, it's just 1.53% of GDP, well below the 2% threshold that NATO members set themselves a few years ago. So um, with that background, let's turn to the Tims for a closer look. And I'll start with you, Tim Fish, if I may. Um, You report on moves to produce fundamental reform to the German army that some senior officers argue is quite badly needed. What's your take on that? Yeah, um, I was listening to the Rusi Land Warfare Conference the other week and um, the chief of the German army, uh, Alphonse Mace, um, he was quite uh, open about the kind of challenges that lay ahead for the German army in particular. Uh, this this follows um, what happened in the end of May, which is uh, the German army started withdrawing from Afghanistan. I think we spoke last week about how the US was um, was pulling out and the impact that would have on the Allies who would have to withdraw in advance because they're not really able to um, uh, to stay there without US support. So they're going ahead with that. And at the same time, uh, the German army put out a paper talking about sort of a lot of structural reform that would enable um, the German army, the German Bundeswehr overall, to be able to conduct more high-intensity warfighting operations rather than just stability operations. So um, Lieutenant General Mace was was quite explicit about how the whole German army, the structure is, is all designed for stability operations, which is great. But at the same time, uh, that's not what you want going forward. You need to have the, the structures enabled to do both. And for him, it was a lot, a lot of the challenges are actually at the political level, which I thought was quite interesting because um, what, what he he actually said was there needs to be a mental change in our political and military leadership 
And um, his biggest challenge is discussing with politicians in Berlin that the military isn't just a tool book, two box where you can dip in and pick out formations that you can send away for multinational stability operation. But you need large formations that are structured, equipped and trained to fight. And that the army's got a long way to go, uh, more so than the other forces. Um, and he was quite uh, he was quite explicit in his critiques, saying that um, for the German army, efficiency is more important than effectiveness, and centralization is more important than decentralization. As well as um, highlighting that sort of functional stovepipe orientated processes are more important than cohesive, well trained, and well equipped larger formations that are able to conduct that kind of high intensity warfare that they want. So they kind of got a long way to go. Um, the um, the priority is to for them is to um, build up a mechanised um, brigade. Um, they've Germany is um, leading NATO's uh, very high readiness joint task force in 2023. And this is uh, sort of a big deal for them. Uh, so they really need to get the forces ready for that. And there have been a few hiccups on the way, but they're, they're kind of progressing towards that, that immediate target in the short term. Yes, uh, as I understand it, uh, the very high readiness task force uh, is an extremely high priority for Germany, but uh, it's going to be difficult. Of course, they're, t- they're trying to do two things at once, as you say. Um, the uh, General Mace talks about the need to drive cultural change and political change, while also building up, uh, building up the German army to undertake these kind of new types of missions. Um, with the very high readiness task force, um, as I understand it, there there were some problems with one of the key components of that task force on the uh, IFV side. I was wondering if you could shed a bit more light on that. Yeah, it was reported that there were some um, problems with the Puma infantry fighting vehicle at the end of last year uh, in the operational tests. Um, but this has apparently been fixed in early this year in February. And uh, Lieutenant General Mace actually announced the um, the qualification of the, the sort of Panzer Grenadier Battalion Um so that seems like they've they've sorted that problem out. The, the numbers aren't massive. Um, it's about 40 Puma infantry fighting vehicles who become capable of integrating with the uh, IDZ future solder system. And um, this would mean they're able to conduct network operations, which is what they need uh, to, to be a part of this uh, very high readiness joint task force. Um, and then they're doing sort of reforms as well. So you've got 17 Leopard 2A7s, they're going to have uh, active protection systems and they've got a new battle management system as well. Which, again, these are not large numbers, but this is what they need to to be able to lead this task force in the future. So they're, they're pushing ahead with these kind of programs and they're also upgrading um, the some artillery systems. But Mace was quite concerned that there must be additional forces prepared if you want to create a division size force, which is what they want to do by 2027. Um, and they need division-level support troops so they can become faster and more efficient. They need bridging systems, counter-UAS systems, they need to be fully digitised, um, proper combat management system modernization, and uh, introduce a long-range fires capability as well. So um, this and, and, and the, the, having the ability to have the uh, sustainability of these large formations when they come into action. Um, I mean, a part of the whole cultural change is um, that Germany doesn't really like talking about its defence or the military or anything to do with warfare, to be honest. So that's quite a leap for them to to, to kind of take on this uh, modernisation as well as uh, can sort of take on the cultural battle that needs to be done uh, with the, the public and in, in the political arena as well. Clearly there's plenty of ground for the uh, German army to cover both on the political and technological side for it to uh, achieve its objectives. Um, Tim Martin, uh, on, on the air side, um, General Mice said in his speech that, uh, as, as uh, Tim Fisher uh, alluded to in his comments, that um, the German Air Force, relatively speaking, has gone further than the army in becoming a more mobile reactive force for war fighting. Um, does that comment uh, seem, seem accurate to you? I mean, it's it's hard to make a, a firm judgment on that one, Ben, and, and certainly by dint of the procurement issues that Germany are having on the other side, and I think that it's probably best to kind of suggest that that doesn't really 
link to to reality um and it's you know maybe talking up uh capability uh, in a way that kind of objectively you, you could uh you could uh pull apart um you know you could have uh, issues with and certainly the long term future of the german air force uh, in terms of the, the twist and turns linked to procurement and um, i'm not sure you could you could argue uh for that um, to be the case um certainly if you were um outside uh, the german armed forces you can, there's definitely a lot to go off um to to argue otherwise well, certainly, uh, there have been problems on the on the heavy lift uh, procurement side, and uh, you've been covering that very recently. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. We'll, we'll get into it, and I'll I'll kick off with heavy lift. But you know, you you can pick anything that you really want in terms of procurement on the German side, whether it's heavy lift, whether it's the difficulties around FCAS, whether it's the Eurofighter, um, or sorry, the Tornado replacement split by that was just hugely um, political um, and then whether it's the the issues around the replacement for the, the p3 and um, you know the 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 p8 is the interim solution that we're being told um anyway there is a there's a, a lot to go off and um, to suggest that um procurement and modernization is is absolutely n- are is is well off track uh, and not going as uh, according to plan and um, but as you mentioned yeah I was writing uh, this week about the the heavy lift program and um, just to cover that cover the bases in terms of what the, the main issues and um points are to do with the program itself um for a long time germany has wanted um to buy 44 to, to 60 uh, new aircraft to replace the ch53 and um, g fleet um and that uh, the out of service date is 2025 uh, for that one so um in september of last year um the program was cancelled and the german mod cited um that offers were uneconomical. In other words, um, the offers put forward by Sikorsky, her offer in the U.S. Marine Corps in development, um, CH-53K, King Stallion, and uh, Boeing, who are offering the CH-47F Chinook, um, they pretty much maxed, not only maxed out the, the budget, but were well above um, the estimates that uh, Germany had calculated. Um, so, some months later, then uh, Sikorsky put uh, a request to have the, the tender process and the cancellation uh, reviewed uh, by a tri- procurement tribunal, and uh, they wanted a decision to be ruled in their favour that would, in effect, uh, force the German MOD to restart the competition, pretty much under the same stipulations that had gone before, because the German MOD have since moved to. Uh, what really looks like a, an FMS a strategy. Um, so looking at uh, or requesting from the US government uh, pricing and availability of both the Chinook and the King Stallion. Um, whereas the pre-cancellation, this was a, a direct commercial sale where you obviously had um, more correspondence between the German MOD and industry. And industry, you know, could, could supply the data and, uh, you know, could have back and forth uh, with the, the German MOD. So long short story short, that didn't quite work out for Sikorsky in that the Federal Tribunal um, dismissed uh, the request. Um, but they did say that the, the process uh, by which the German MOD uh, issued the tender was uh, unlawful. Um, the reason why it was unlawful really was um, that the calculations and the costs were not transparent. Um, from the, the German MOD side. So basically, the, the German MOD received a slap on the, the wrist pretty much from the tribunal. But now uh, Sikorsky wants to appeal that decision. Uh, and in October, uh, the Dusseldorf uh, Regional Higher Court will hear the appeal. What's significant about that is that all procurement plans now and the German MOD going down the uh, FMS route. All of that is uh, on hold until October, until this decision is heard. And uh, that completely messes up the plans uh, from Germany that were published in February in a position paper uh, that was uh, signed by the German defense minister. Uh, and so I think, you know, that uh, really on this one, 
you can you can take from it that this is another twist for the, the German heavy lift program that has that has already had a number and you know there's there's no we're no closer to to knowing who who is going to have the production contract at the end of the day um, and in any case uh, there's already a, a delay um, on that until at least the end of uh, 2022 and then of course you'll have um, uh, the German parliament having to approve funding uh, and we know that the difficulties that uh, that surround those types of things as well. Do you think um so do you think that uh has this been running for quite a long time then prior to prior to this decision and also um which do you think would be the best platform? Yeah, I mean it's in terms of if you just want to look at it in terms of I can answer best platform fairly straightforward and I don't think uh you know the manufacturers might disagree clearly but um the the capabilities of the 53k and you know it has a, a third engine it's able to carry um bigger loads uh, and you know in terms of transporting uh, equipment and so forth th- there's probably it's it's almost indisputable that that, that is the the best uh the best aircraft uh available. Now, I won't be thanked for Boeing for having said that, but then, you know, on, on the Boeing side, and um, to do them justice, they have clearly uh, an immense amount of uh, experience with the Chinook and the export record is is almost flawless. And, you know, you could imagine then that the the unit cost obviously is significantly um, cheaper from, from the Boeing side as well. And uh, so, you can you can see arguments from both, but to add to pretty much, you know, if if money wasn't involved, clearly you would be moving for the the fifty three k. I would say is the stallion still under development though. So therefore, if Germany wanted to go for the higher spec aircraft, they there's a bit of risk with that, I suppose. Yeah, it? that that's exactly it. Um, so Israel have just become the first launch customer for the 53K. But then you look through the budget documents that were released by the US um, some weeks ago. And, and, you know, we talked about this, but the unit price of the 53K has risen, um, if my calculations aren't mistaken, by about 4.5 million. And that's from FI 2021 to FI 2022. Now, you, you think to yourself, okay, well, it's, it's not a huge amount of money, but actually it's it's almost tipping to a hundred million. It's around ninety five um, million dollars, um, and the unit cost that that uh, DI have for the the the, the Chinook is twenty seven million. So you know, do the maths there. It's uh, oh, that's pretty pretty considerable. Yeah, yeah it's a ridiculous uh, <laughs> difference. But also the, I mean, Sikorsky. The 53K program, rather, didn't uh, cover itself in glory or from the, the FY 2022 request because there's um, in the summary, it also mentions that the, the Marine Corps had always planned to buy 11 in FY 2022, but because of the increase of the airframe, they're only going to buy nine now. So, and again, you think, well, it's only a difference of two. Well, let me put it like this. The, the Marine Corps want 200 of these and the more the price goes up and the more that the the quantity of aircraft changes um, year on year, the longer out, of course, it is that you, you reach the uh, initial operating capability and, you know, perhaps there's bigger pressure then on being able to actually meet that program of record and you might potentially and ultimately have to reduce the, the 200 by. Um, now, that's not officially. There's no official sources suggesting the program for uh, re- program of record is going to be changed, or there's a, a reckoning coming in um, in the near term. But you know, you just have to look at the numbers and you know the some of the issues that have uh, impacted the aircraft previously. I, you know, they, they have been fixed, yes, but um, you know, I would say that there's still a long road ahead with the 53k, certainly. Okay, guys, I'm afraid we're running out of time a little bit, so we've got to end it there, but um, clearly there's plenty to discuss on matters of German procurement. Uh, Thank you both once again for your insights. Um, For our listeners, as always, you can find out more on German Defence News and much more on our website. 
Also, just a reminder, if you uh, haven't listened already to last week's episode 23, it was a very interesting conversation on French defence exports, and you can catch up with it by visiting our website or go to Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now it's time for a short break, and then I'll be back on the line, this time with Asia-Pacific editor Gordon Arthur, with all the news from that region. Stay tuned. Lockheed Martin to deliver target site systems for FNF companies. Smart Force to Australian KC. 30... Spanish tactical communications portfolio. Naval laser weapon development. Multi-band terminal production continues with the... Five, not 15, block four aircraft to receive EW upgrade. Cut through the noise of defense procurement with Shepard's Defense Insight. Save time identifying opportunities, mitigate risk, and get ahead of the competition with the most user-friendly platform in the market. Head over to shepherdmedia.com slash demo to request your free demo integrated program and equipment data at your fingertips can get you ahead of the competition. Welcome back to our regular catch-up on defence news from the Asia-Pacific region. With me is Gordon Arthur, who can highlight some of the biggest stories over the past few weeks. Hi, Gordon. Hi there, Ben. Good to talk to you again. Good to talk to you too. Uh, let's get the ball rolling in South Korea, where the Madex trade show took place from the 9th to the 12th of June. And there looks to be some movement on a plan to design and build a new carrier. So perhaps you can uh, start there. For sure. Yeah, unfortunately, we weren't able to get to South Korea because of the, the current COVID travel restrictions. Uh, but there was uh, news about the uh, the CVX program uh, for the South Korean Navy. Um, and this is basically a, a light aircraft carrier. Now, we should point out that this program has not been approved yet. Uh, in fact, there's going to be quite a, a struggle uh, for the Ministry of National Defence to get approval uh, from the government for funding. And probably there's quite a bit of public opposition to it as well, wondering why on earth would South Korea require a, a light aircraft carrier. But nonetheless, uh, there were a couple of South Korean shipbuilding firms um, at the MADEX exhibition, and they were proposing different designs uh, for the carrier. So perhaps I can just give you a little bit of a description of each, Ben. Please do. So uh, we had Daewoo Shipbuilding and Marine Engineering. Uh, they were one of the, the two companies. And the notable thing about this was it was a pretty conventional design. There was no ski jump uh, for the, the aircraft. Um, details released by DSME gave it a length of 263 metres, displacement of 45,000 tonnes and the carrier will be able to accommodate around about 16 fighters on its flight deck and another 12 in the hangar. And the other competing design is from uh, Hyundai Heavy Industries, and they had a, perhaps some might call it a more innovative um, design. So it had a, a ski rump, uh, sorry, a ski ramp, not a ski rump, it had a ski ramp, and uh, it also had a, a special area um, designated for UAVs, so vertical um, landing UAVs, which was a, an interesting design feature. So it's designed 270 metres long and also displacing around about 45,000 tonnes. Um, the South Korean Air Force is looking to, to buy up to about 20 F-35Bs, and these would be the fighters that would go on these carriers. And South Korea... Um, I think is is looking, not only would it be used for a North Korean um, contingency, but just think also that its neighbours, Japan, China, uh, they're also introducing uh, similar kinds of, of carriers. Uh, China, of course, a, a full carrier rather than just a, a light one. So that was an interesting development from South Korea. Any indication, you mentioned the different designs uh, possibly leading to... Um a different kind of aircraft procurement. So um, which type do you think is more realistic for, for this uh, light carrier if it goes ahead? Um, sort of a short takeoff and vertical landing or, or catapult launched? Yeah, so obviously the the main thing that South Korea will be looking at is uh, um, the Stobar uh, configuration, so short takeoff, but arrested uh, recovery. 
Um, so that that would be the the main one. Um, but I believe the Hyundai design could actually be reconfigured, so it, it could be changed in the future. A catapult could be installed, um, and the advantage of that would be allowing um, more heavily armed and fueled aircraft to take off from the the carrier. Just apart from the F-35, which is the obvi- obvious fighter that South Korea will operate from it, it, there's also talk that Korea Aerospace Industries uh, may well develop a, a carrier-borne version of its KF-21 fighter. Perhaps our listeners will remember that the KF-21 is, is the new name for the, the KFX uh, fighter that's been developed in South Korea. But that's still at least 12 years further down the track. So whether that will actually take off figuratively, uh, we'll have to wait and see. So an interesting story there from from uh, Madex, and uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, whether this light carrier reaches fruition. Um, and staying actually on that uh, show in South Korea last week, uh, there was a big noise about Indonesia ordering eight frigates from Italy. So uh, I think that's quite a significant development. Yeah, I mean, there's been rumours swirling about Ind- Indonesia. It's been linked with Japanese frigates. It's been uh, linked with second-hand German frigates. Uh, there's talk about a deal with uh, the, the Danes. So we know that there has been a, a competition going on for, for new frigates. And this announcement sort of it came a bit un- unexpectedly, perhaps. Um, there were four different uh, ship builders competing uh, that we know of. Um, these were uh, Damon, um, Mitsui in Japan, uh, Finn Cantieri, and also a, a Babcock consortium. And so the, the winner is the, the Italians. So uh, it's the, the Frem uh, frigate design, um, and in the Italian Navy it's called the, the Bergamini class. So this has turned out to be the winner. So Indonesia is going to order six of these frigates, and details in the, the press release that came from the shipbuilder were, were quite um, scant, to be honest. Um, but certainly Indonesia will be looking to do um, indigenous shipbuilding, uh, contributing to it. And there's some rumours that perhaps three of the ships could be built um, in Indonesia, and that would be by by PT Pal, the state-owned shipbuilder um, in Indonesia. Uh, you mentioned eight frigates, and you're absolutely correct. I mentioned six Frem frigates, and the other two would be second-hand uh, Mestral class frigates, uh, which the Italian Navy has slowly been retiring. So two of these would be refurbished by Fincantieri in Italy, and these would be handed over to Indonesia. I think the advantage is that they would be ready um, and delivered uh, a lot sooner, obviously, than when the the new frigates are are built from scratch. So they would be a good uh, stopgap filler for the Indonesian Navy, which for a long time has been looking for for newer and larger ships. Um, It's it's most capable warships at the moment are uh, two Sigma 10514 frigates uh, from Darman. Um, You mentioned Darman as the supplier of the uh, the frigates, uh, legacy frigates as it were, but um, how much of a surprise is it, um, in your view, Gordon, that that Fincantieri got the nod this time? Yeah, um, because it was it's difficult to predict. Uh, one might have thought that perhaps Darman had a, a foot in the door, having already uh, built um, frigates for the Indonesian Navy. And as far as I know, Fincantieri hasn't had an awful lot of success um, in in Asia, certainly in East Asia. So I think it's definitely for them, it's a, a feather in their cap. And it also builds upon um, some recent successes for the, the Frem design. So uh, we have Egypt, um, obviously Italy, France, Morocco, and also the US um, having decided to, to go for that design. Okay. And uh, meanwhile, let's move on to the to the air domain now. And uh, the Philippines remains hopeful of, of buying T-129 ATAC helicopters from Turkey, um, which uh, could be a significant deal for a number of reasons. Um, I mean, to start with, Gordon, um, why why Turkish helicopters for, for the Philippines? Yeah, I think we do have to talk Turkey here, Ben. So <laughs> it's it's been a it's been a long standing desire of the Philippine Air Force to get attack helicopters. Um, there's been a, a program, a, a competition running for for quite a while. Uh, it's looked at American, it's looked at Russian, it's looked at uh, Turkish um, attack helicopters, for example. And I think the 
the Turkish package uh, for the Philippines probably offers the, the best value for money. So we, we have to um, admit that the, the Philippine military is, is not the, the world's most uh, lavishly funded. So by even buying American, even secondhand helicopters, such as the, the AH-1W uh, Super Cobra, um, that would still be quite expensive. So uh, Turkey had put together a, a package um, for the Philippines, and the the biggest hurdle um, that the deal is facing is the fact that the the U.S. has imposed sanctions um, on Turkey um, relating to the sale of of military equipment, and of course the the T one two nine attack helicopter uh, it uses American engines uh, and a few other bits and pieces, and um, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of debate whether the U.S. would actually allow them. Uh, to be exported. Uh, it puts the US in an interesting situation too because it, the Philippines is a an alliance, a treaty partner, um, and yet it also um, has imposed sanctions on Turkey. So whether it will go ahead or not, uh, the rumour is, and this has not been confirmed uh, formally by the US government, but the rumour is that the US will allow export of licences that will allow the sale to go ahead. And the Philippine Air Force is looking to get six um, of these attack helicopters. So if the worst happens for the Philippine Air Force and they can't buy these half dozen T129s, um, what are the alternatives for them? Um, you mentioned second-hand Super Cobras as a potential option. Um, is there anything else? Yeah, I mean that's that's been talked about. Um, the Philippine Air Force for for so many years has always had to make do with secondhand aircraft, and of course that's not always the best way to go because they're going to have a more limited lifespan. Uh, maintenance is going to be uh, more of a burden. So, in recent times, of course, the, the Philippines has bought uh, Black Hawks new ones from Sikorsky. So that was a, uh, a major step forward. Uh, we know from last year, the Defense Security Corporation Agency in the USA, uh, they published approval for the Philippines to buy AH-1Z Vipers and AH-64E um, Apaches. So obviously the Philippines was just inquiring and, and trying to find out pricing and so on. So it does have that option. Um, it definitely wouldn't buy Chinese, and uh, probably Russians not really in the in the frame either. So it would basically come down to Turkish versus U.S. Um, helicopters. Okay, and uh, in terms of the um, concept of operations or mission set that the Philippine Air Force is looking at with these new attack helicopters, presumably the T one two nine, is there some kind of new mission set? Um, in mind here? Yeah, if, if you remember um, a few years ago, there was the, the Battle of Marawi. So this was in Mindanao, and it was a very bloody conflict uh, when uh, basically Islamic insurgents uh, took over a town, and there was a, it was a, a bitter battle to, to get it back. And the helicopters that the Philippine Air Force was using at that time were, were not particularly suited uh, to that kind of warfare. So that was a reminder, I think, to the Philippines that it does need dedicated attack helicopters. And uh, the country, it does face uh, two main threats. There's a, a communist insurgency that's been going on for decades, and it, particularly in the, the southern Philippines, in, in the Mindanao area and, and some of the outlying islands, uh, there's an Islamic um, insurgency going on as well. So yeah, dedicated hel attack helicopters certainly are... Um, a, a necessary asset that would help the Philippine military a lot. So from uh, Turkish helicopters potentially for counterinsurgency operations um, to Turkish uh, land equipment um, for Bangladesh. Uh, it seems that uh, Turkish exporters have been pretty busy in the region. So um, take it away on Bangladesh. Yeah, I mean, we haven't been to a, a defence show for, for more than a year, but um, if we recall, I mean, Asia Pacific, the, the Turkish defence manufacturers, they, they've been really out in force. Um, compared to five years ago, you'd be lucky to see a Turkish company at all. So uh, Turkish companies have really been pushing some of their their hardware, um, particularly in Asia, and it has had some success. 
Uh, so as you mentioned, uh, we have T-300 multiple rocket launches uh, that Rocketsan in Turkey has sold uh, to the Bangladesh Army. And I don't recall talking about Bangladesh on um, our podcast before, so I thought this would be an interesting one just to um, quickly mention it. So uh, these particular rocket launches, I believe 18 launches were procured, and these are all based on a, a Russian 6 by 6 truck chassis. And the, the T-300, it can fire 122 millimeter and 300 millimeter rockets. And there's also a, a missile available that can be fired as well. So maximum range up to 120 kilometers um, for uh, the armaments. So we know that uh, Bangladesh also bought um, ammunition resupply, command vehicles, meteorolo- meteorology and maintenance repair vehicles to go with its rocket launches. Um, so these these arrived, um, I believe, early June, and Bangladeshi soldiers have actually been in Turkey uh, training on the the T three hundred, learning how it operates and so on. Um, and according to to Shepard Defence Insight, uh, Turkey's the oh, sorry Bangladesh is the third country to obtain these rocket launches. Previously, it was um, Turkey and Azerbaijan. So that's a, a new user for this piece of equipment. Okay, and uh, well, the Bangladesh Army does appear to be pretty active in terms of uh, importing equipment at the moment because uh, um, you also report that there are some exports from China that are expected. Yeah, I've, I've been looking for this one for, for quite a while, so um, it should be happening soon. Um, I don't know how soon, but hopefully very soon. <laughs> but we believe uh, the Bangladesh Army is awaiting the arrival of a regiment's worth of VT-5 light tanks from Norinco in China. Um, perhaps they'll arrive in June, uh, perhaps a little bit later. So a regiment, maybe 44 tanks. And this is significant because this is the no, the first known export of the, the VT-5 uh, light tank. Um, and if, if you're up with armored fighting vehicles, as you probably are, Ben, then you'll know that the, the VT-5 is basically the export version of the, the Type 15, or in the PLA it's called the, the ZTQ-15. Um, so this is a, um, a major piece of news for, for Bangladesh. Okay. Um, is there any, any information as to whether it replaces uh, an existing capability or does it actually augment uh, a fleet of uh, tanks that's already there? Yeah, I believe it will it'll augment. Um, they have a, fl- a fleet of more than 170 Type 59G tanks. So these were, these were heavier tanks um, purchased from China and they, they have been upgraded locally uh, with Chinese assistance. But I guess the the Type 15 or the, the VT5, the, the advantage is it's, it's lighter. It's not as heavy as a main battle tank. And if you consider the, the terrain of Bangladesh, um, it's probably quite a good fit for what the army requires. Okay. Let's move now from, from light tanks uh, to Bangladesh um, to China itself, where um, there's actually been a capability leap in terms of armoured vehicles for the PLA Marine Corps. Yeah, I mean, we were just talking about the Type 15 tank and, and lo and behold, in the first week of June, we discover that actually the, the PLA Navy Marine Corps is actually also acquiring uh, the the Type 15 tank. And the, the revelation came from a, a CCTV report um, that was aired on Chinese TV. And it actually showed PLA Marines um, examining some of these tanks aboard rail cars. And the report told us that they'd just completed a, an exercise in a, a high altitude area, which would normally um, refer to Tibet or Xinjiang uh, up in northwest China. And so it seems that the, the Marines have been re-equipped or are re-equipping um, with light tanks. And they've never had like a, a dedicated tank before. They have had armoured vehicles. They have um, the ZBD-05 and the associated ZTD-05, uh, which are basically an amphibious assault vehicles. Uh, they also have uh, eight by eight wheeled armoured vehicles. So it, it does represent a significant, significant beefing up of the capabilities of the Marines. In fact, the the CCTV report 
um, the, the whole thrust of it was to describe the fact that the, the PLA Navy Marines uh, actually becoming more um, a combined arms and multi-domain force. Uh, normally, we would think of the Marines as a, an amphibious landing force, um, but it seems they, they are branching out. And I have to, to make a note here too, Ben, the, the lines between the PLA ground forces and the Marines do seem to be blurring somewhat. Uh, we already know that um, six combat brigades in the PLA ground forces, they, uh, they are already amphibious. So they have uh, similar um, kinds of vehicles. So, they, yeah, they, they can do the same thing as the, the Marines. And now the Marines are also receiving light tanks the same as, as what the Army is. So there, there is an overlap between what the ground forces and the, the Marines can do. But I think also it, it tells us that the, the Chinese Marines are, are certainly looking at expeditionary missions, the ability to deploy overseas um, and to uh, deploy even heavier vehicles and forces while they're there. It's an interesting story for the reasons that you mentioned, Gordon, and also because although the Chinese are looking to uh, perhaps use their ma Marines for multi-domain operations, um, which is kind of similar to the doctrine that's being developed um, by the US Marine Corps, um, at the same time there's a big difference, it seems, between China and the US in terms of their Marines because um, the Marines are actually getting rid of their armour um, under Force Design 2030. Um, why do you think there is this contrast? Yeah, it's it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because the the US Marines, they, they said they have to modernise and, and get ready for future uh, combat, future conflicts. And China is, is uppermost uh, in its thinking at the moment. So it wants to be leaner, it wants to be meaner, it wants the ability to, to deploy to islands, to, to far-flung places uh, quickly and easily. And so as as you correctly said, they've, they've actually decommissioned uh, all their M1A1 Abrams tanks. So they've got rid of their armour. And then lo and behold, um, a short time later, we find out that the PLA Marines, um, they're getting tanks uh, for the first time. Will this cause a rethink in the, the US Marines? No, I don't think so. Um, they, they sort of have charted their, their course. Um, but yeah, just, just a reminder that uh, things can, can change quite quickly on the ground. Thank you very much indeed, Gordon. For over 40 years, Shepard has led the defense and aerospace sector with magazines, equipment handbooks, and cutting-edge news stories. Shepard now champions the best business information and marketing solutions across digital, so your business can have the decisive edge in everything you do. Make your team the competitive advantage. Partner with Shepherd today. Get in touch with one of our customer experts to discuss your needs at shepherdmedia.com. So welcome to this week's Industry Voice segment. This week we're sponsored by Raytheon Intelligence in Space. I'm sitting down with Mark Davis, who's a mission systems architect for Raytheon Intelligence in Space, as well as Madison Dye, who's a systems engineer for Raytheon Intelligence in Space. Uh, gentlemen, first of all, welcome to the podcast. Hello, Tony. Thanks for having us. Today, we're talking about digital engineering and, you know, really wanted to sort of strip that back to the basics, get an idea of, um, you know, of this segment. Just, I guess, to set the scene, um, recently, the, the former U.S. Air Force Acquisition Chief, Will Roper, called for disruptive agility. In other words, a new digital paradigm. I mean, was this a significant change in direction for the aerospace and defense industry from where you guys are coming from? Uh, where I sit, I, I was uh, 25 years within the Air Force and, and now I've been about three years at Raytheon. And this is some things that we've been working on over the last decades, but pulling them all together into one environment where everything's connected digitally and there ends up being one digital uh, source of truth. So all the data is in one place. Everybody that wants to look at the data goes to that one place and, and sees it. That That's really the change. It's We've always had the data. Some of it's been on paper, you know, passed around between engineer to engineer. Some of it's been in spreadsheets, but now we're talking about the real revolution of putting it all together 
in a one environment that everybody can interrogate at the same time, including our customers as well as our engineers. And that is exactly one of the biggest shifts is that this is what our customer is asking for. It's no longer what we think is best or what the industry thinks is best. It's what our customers need and what they want and how they want to see things done going forward. So that's something that we're working to address uh, for them. So they get the best uh, value from us right now. Excellent. And I mean, I guess to further put this in context, we're obviously facing a very different world than we were 12, 18 months ago. Um, obviously, COVID-19 has sort of changed the way the world works. I mean, has, has digital engineering become more proliferated in the sort of environment that we're facing currently? I mean, how, how do you guys sort of view that? Uh, Mark, if I sort of throw that back at you. Right. Well, we, we work at many classification levels. On the classified work side, it hasn't changed things a lot because we have to go into the office every day to do that work. But I would say on the unclass side, everybody working from anywhere in the world really can connect into our environments virtually from home or from the beach or wherever they end up being uh, at their work day. And uh, that, that has helped. And, and the infrastructure behind that, that's really helped speed things up, I think, from that perspective. Yeah, I'd love to further that. I've, I've worked the last six months through COVID on an unclassified program with a team virtually, some of whom I've never met. And there's no more bumping into each other in the hallways. There's no more, oh, we were at the same lunch table conversations. This is, you have to be very diligent and uh, very intentional with finding out those little nuggets of information that you were getting from the lunchroom or the hallway. And you have to use digital means to come across that information. So it is really important for our employees at Raytheon to be intentional with their time and intentional with managing all their new projects in this digital engineering realm so that we can make sure that all the information information is getting disseminated between all the team members. Yeah, I, I, and that's a, a really a good point. Um, I mean, we've, as, as a publishing company, we've found difficulty being working remotely and finding that communications can get lost and those things that we used to d discuss in the office or, you know, at, down the pub, I guess, um, you know, we're no longer, those conversations were no longer happening. So we had to kind of try and replicate that. From a, I mean, from a digital engineering point of view, can we talk more about, you know, how do you change the culture of a company to make sure that this is effective and, you know, in the, the aspect we're talking about? So I could start that off again. Uh, being a little older, uh, one of the things that I see in my, in my uh, age group is people really ha are ingrained in their way of doing things. And it, and it generally has been paper and their own fancy spreadsheets that they have. And and it's, it, it's my uh, career group that I think is the challenge for the culture. And, but they, they also bring all the lessons learned and the scars for how things were done poorly in the past. And so I, I think it's a great way. And I think Mass will talk about the other side of it, being slightly younger than me, at least three years younger than me. Um, the, the young and the old come together, the young are bringing what they've learned in college and the digital environments they've learned and it's sort of ingrained in them and the old bringing the lessons learned and bringing those two things together and pulling the old guys along to this new way of doing things and teaching the young guys and gals how to do things right i think those two things are the way to to build this to to get it to be done correctly I think that's absolutely spot on and, you know, attacking from the, the younger side moving forward, I would say early in career folks are, are coming in more predisposed to using digital means to make educated decisions. So the easiest example is I live in Los Angeles. If I want to go eat, I know where I'm going. I make a reservation on my phone. All of that is backed up on my iCloud account you know, uh, data storage and, and having uh, copies of information in, in different places is something that I've been used to since, you know, I was growing up with, with uh, an iPhone in my hand since middle school, right? So all of the, the early and career folks that are coming in from college now understand how to back things up on a cloud. They understand how to make decisions using, using digital means, and they understand how to get information to people quickly with the use of things like 
social media, which is very equivalent to the, the sharing type products that we have across enterprises now. So these are all second nature and worked into universities, worked into collaborative groups that all of these new graduates are, are working in when, when they're going through their education. So they're coming in with a leg up on the competition. They understand how to get things out there. They understand how to have virtual meetings, communicate virtually, make those decisions using, using digital and virtual means. So just to summarize that some of the hurdles around defense procurements are, are relatively well known, but it does sound like digital engineering has the potential to speed up the schedule of delivery and I guess overall in, increase customer confidence in you know, what the defense industry as a whole is, is doing. Where else does digital en engineering come in um, in terms of you know, the defense industry being more effective, being able to deliver capability to the customer in a more rapid sort of uh, manner? Uh, it, so a really interesting thing is we say digital engineering, but it really is not just about engineers, right? We can have really detailed discussions and use a lot of amazing digital tools that will take our cost modeling capabilities and be able to disseminate that information to the program leadership so that we can make better cost technology and schedule decisions going forward. And I think what Mark can offer in this conversation is really good uh, details on how it works and the actual engineering of our products. So I'll hand that over to Mark. Right, a big part of my responsibility is doing what we call mission performance assessment. So I have a group of engineers that does modeling and SIM and is able to assess our technology's performance in realistic mission scenarios. And connecting that kind of environment into this digital environment or the, the source of truth for the design or the production allows us through the through the requirements phase, through the design phase, and all the way through the build and operations to be able to quickly understand if there's a change in a requirement or a design, how that ripples through the system to mission performance. And in the past, that would take months to figure out and lots of engineers doing paper analysis. Now we're able to turn that crank, that full crank, including the cost that Madison talked about, to show how a, a change will impact the overall cost schedule and, and performance of the system. And we can do that quickly now. And that used to be, again, a long uh, process to happen. And that allows us to really, the, the big benefit of that is to be able to uh, respond to all these big changes in the threats that are coming along. Our adversaries are turning their process faster and putting out more advanced threats faster and faster. And we can't afford to have 10 year programs that never change for the 10 years. We need to be able to um, change them in the design if we need to. And then even on, on orbit for space systems or during operations, we need to be able to upload new applications and understand how those applications are gonna work in as quick as we can. But that's, a, that's a huge benefit to our customers. And that's a great note to, to end on. Um, obviously, disruptive agility, the idea of a new digital paradigm, that's a very evocative sort of idea, but it does sound like it's well embedded in, in your culture and, and what you guys are doing, which is really great to see. So yeah, I guess just to wrap things up, uh, Mark and Madison, I mean, thanks very much for your time. Absolutely, thank you. This episode of the Weekly Defence Podcast was brought to you in partnership with our sponsor, Raytheon Intelligence and Space. A big thank you to everybody who took the time to be with us today. And for our listeners, if you enjoyed the show, make sure you like and subscribe or leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to know more about the market landscape in the defence sector, visit shepherdmedia.com slash subscribe and redeem your free trial to our premium news, where you get international coverage of equipment innovation, company news, program updates, and more from our team of expert journalists. Until next week, thank you for listening.